This evening, we are going to explore a curious problem. And I'm calling it the real problem, I think, of our age is the recovery of Platonism. It's a very strange search because it constitutes, in fact, a lost treasure that takes an explanation. The way Plato is taught today and all of the universities is that it does not entertain nor teach the notion that it is a spiritual discipline. Plato is a Platonic yoga, magnificent, structured, progressive, descriptive, and psychologically profound. Now, when Carl Jung did this work called um, Psychology and Alchemy, which is a real fine work, and um, he did this um, 1953. Let me just make sure. Yeah, 1953, Psychology and Alchemy. No. The reason I call it strange is because the work we're going to look at in Psychology and Alchemy, Carl Jung describes it and gives the title of it, The Treaties of Platonic Tetralogies, sets of four. He also gives the Latin source name for it, the Libra Platonis Quartorium. Obviously, there's nothing obscure about its source. It's Plato. Now, what I find rather interesting is that when Carl Jung is going to show us how to understand this Platonic tetralogies, he doesn't go into Plato. He goes into alchemy. And he doesn't just go into alchemy. He goes into hermetic thought. which is a um, early philosophical movement that flourished at the time of around the uh, first two, three, four centuries of our era and came back into Europe at around four, in strength at 495 because Ficino's great translations from the play, from the uh, Platonic school in Florence. The first one he translated was the work on Hermetic philosophy in 1495. After that, he translated Plato and many of the great Greek classics and a great number until into the 1500s, Europe for the first time had Plato in Latin translation. Before that, there was no Plato in Europe to speak of. A few a few dialogues badly translated or in parts, but for the first time we can speak of the Platonic tradition entering Europe begins in the 1500s. That's 16th century. Um, the first English translations, the whole thing, had to await until 1805 and on. So that in English, we've had Plato for only half as long as we've had Shakespeare. But let's go on. Now first, I would like to spend a few minutes on this work called the Platonic Tratologies, which is on page 250, which is on page 250 in Carl Jung's Psychology and Alchemy. Now, I represented this work. It's really sets of four. And I just left out the alchemical terms for simplicity. Now, what is this? Now, I passed around for you a copy of that page that sets out these tetralogies. Now, when anybody looks at this, 
They have to decipher it. It has to be deciphered. Well, I'm going to decipher it for you. But on the pages that you have in front of you, you have Carl Jung's understanding of it. And he has some quotes from the source, which is the Platonic Tetralogies. Now, let us just put this aside for a while and talk about something else. All right, I'm going to move away from this. I'm going to talk about Plato. In Plato's Republic, there are two paramount ideas that are expanded in order to talk about the spiritual evolution of man. The first is called the divided line. And the second is called the great allegory of the cave and the upper world. Now, anybody who gets into Plato and Plato's Republic has to deal with these two together since this is a pictorial and allegorical way of understanding the divided line. So I'm going to ignore the way in which you can understand it allegorically, and I'm just going to look at what is called the divided line. Now, Plato is interested in representing in one model the whole process, the whole structure, the whole way of understanding the entire spiritual development of man. And he puts it very clearly in the sixth book at about 510, the Stephanus number, very famous line. And I'd like to just read you first why he goes into this curious thing called the divided line. Um, it's so beautiful, I think I may get lost in it and not come out of it for a while. So I'll have to skip a bit. So I'm in the tail end of this, and this is where he picks up. And I'm going to the conclusion out of which comes this divided line. The sun provides not only the power of being seen for things seen, but, as I think you will agree, also their generation, growth, nurture, although it is not itself generation. Of course not. Similarly, with things known, you will, you will agree that the good is not only the cause of their being known, but the cause that knowledge exists and the state of knowledge. Although the good is not itself a state of knowledge, but something transcending far beyond it in dignity and power. Oh Lord, what a devil of a hyperbola, says Glaucon. It's all your fault for compelling me to say what I think about it. Oh, please don't stop. At least do finish the comparison with the sun if you're leaving anything out. Oh yes, I am leaving a lot out. Not one little bit, please. Well, I'm afraid I must leave out a good deal, but I won't willingly leave anything out now if I can help it. Well then, please do not. Conceive then that they are these two. One reigns over the region of things of the mind, the other over those of the eye. And so he starts. Conceive, therefore, that there are two things. One 
reigns over the things of the eye, the visible world, and the other over the intellectual world, right? And that is the good, or the one. <clears throat> now, Plato, <clears throat> carefully to push this analogy with great care, he says, therefore, for the sun there is a light, and that light therefore uh, nourishes, develops, and provides the principle of growth for all things. So here we have the sun and its light. And here he says, the good, which is the highest term, just as the sun gives birth to its light, so the good gives birth to the most brilliant light of being. This is sometimes called, as we've said before, the divine luminosity. Then he says, look here, you know what we have to do? We have to represent this. We have to represent this as a line. He said, let's cut a line. A line in such a way that the smaller, smaller is to the greater in a very interesting way. As the whole is to the greater, as the whole is to the greater, so the greater is to the smaller. That's called a golden section, which is the most beautiful of all proportions. So therefore, you must cut, therefore, each accordingly. Therefore, we can say these are the divisions. That means, therefore, that this is the greater in the greater, and this is the greater in the lesser. Now he says, you know what? There's in the world of sight. Right? Now, this becomes the basis for the allegory of the cave. Right here, we have the allegory of the cave. We can draw the allegory of the cave right on top of this. And we might do that in a few minutes. But now, in these divisions, he's going to show the cognitive functions of the mind. And the, the, the curious thing about it, you see, is that the language he uses for this is a subject of great dispute because uh, people want to call it one term rather than another. But I'm going to stay pretty close to the actual wording itself. Now, I have the Rouse translation. I also have the Republic and many other translations. But um, I just want to show it to you. All right, that's called the divided line. It's a structure. This is the Platonic Tetralogies. Now he says, this is the images seen. This is the source of them. In the same way, when we're talking about the higher metaphysical functions, he says, here we have the very interesting property of understanding. And here we have the use of the exercise of the highest part of the mind, the intellect. Now, this part is to this part. This is the realm of opinion. This is the realm of the intelligible. What does opinion mean? Opinion means, into Plato, any statement you make about anything in the visible world. 
any statement you make about the visible world is the realm of opinion. There is a cup on the podium. Ah, that statement belongs in the class of opinion. Since everything I'm saying about it is in the visible world, therefore all the statements about the visible world are in two classes. You either can make statements about the, the things that are seen, or you can talk about uh, the moment of its apperception. That is to say, you either can talk about a sensation, or you can talk about it as the process of, of perceiving. Now, therefore, this often is called pistis, or belief. And uh, this is called, very often, it gets the proper name of image thinking. So therefore, the way the particular images strike our consciousness, or the created image in the mind, that's this realm, picture thinking. Now, if you get to the source of them, that's belief. In here, equally well, there's certain objects that belong to each. Now, here are simple ideas that are only apprehended by the understanding and have nothing to do whatsoever with the visible world. So all statements that deal in philosophy with statements about the intellectual world belong in the class of understanding. And I'll make one up. All right? Here we have one. The intellectual grasp of the divine luminosity is always accompanied with a state of bliss. Now, nothing I've said belongs in the world of appearance. It all has to do with the mind. Therefore, it's in the realm of the intelligible. All the ideas I spoke about in that are simple ideas. Now, there are another class of ideas which are called the intelligible ideas, the Platonic forms, that they're sometimes called. Beauty itself. Beauty itself. Justice itself. Ideas such as that, they're called the Platonic forms in the true sense. So now, you know what that means? That means two things, you see. That we have four functions of, of the soul, or the psyche, if you prefer. That is, when we receive images directly, when we try to trace them back to their origin, when we, under, we try to enter into the realm of understanding and only talk about things of the mind, and then we go to their primordial source. So therefore, we're dealing with understanding and the exercise of intellect. Different. Now, let's see if we can talk about this in another way. Um, if there is a particular interesting practice that can bring you to an insight into beauty itself, then I'm going to describe it in a certain way, and then you'll be able to grasp those I ideas simply. They become, therefore, objects of the understanding. But now, if you try to apply them, put it into practice, use it to see whether or not there really is a thing called beauty in itself, that's the exercise of the intellect, and you're going over here. So these are statements about the intelligible world, and the intelligible world has to become an object of experience. Remember I said the two things interesting. Here's the second thing. That means not only are these different cognitive functions, but if you want to understand this, you have to go to its higher. If you want to understand this as a whole, you have to go to its higher. If you want to understand this, what they call understanding, you have to go to the exercise of the intellect. If you want to 
begin to understand what lies behind that, what makes that possible, well, what makes the visible world possible and life and nutrition possible is the light of the sun. But the light of the sun owes its existence to the sun itself. In the same way, justice, beauty in itself, these things owe their existence to that most brilliant light of being, what is called divine luminosity, and the source of that is the good, sometimes called the one. Now, I've taken you through with a little degree of freedom this thing called the divided line. A set of four, four kinds of things in it, divided in a way in which it is, two stages here, two stages here, the whole thing, therefore, is a set of four, a set of four, set of four. Therefore, they're tetralogies, sets of four. Now, look at this rather curious thing we have here. Hi. Yeah, yeah. One more question, please. Um, in number E, where you have beauty and justice. In itself. It, it's like they're raw commodities or absolutes or generics, yes? Like love, truth, beauty, not like a picture which is beautiful or... or this is the highest experience possible for man, an unfolding of a vision of beauty in itself. Are those the only two things? No, that you no. Have? We have, we can have beauty, justice, the idea of the good, yeah, we can, we can have others. But they're all high quality, they're what all call positive things that yes. you wouldn't have. Uh, you wouldn't place ugliness. In no, 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 no. It's Impossible. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, that's quite true. No opposites. No opposites. Now, as you look at your page here in front of you, what uh, Jung uses as the tetralogies, here are column one, natural things and their source elements from which they came. Same as this. Now he doesn't have a category here. He just has a general name for what it means. And that is the soul emerges from nature. So everything above that line is nature. Everything above that line is nature. What we would call in the realm of opinion, the visible world. Therefore, the top level is the visible world. Now, that visible world that's made up of composite, a composite nature, you can separate it into categories. It's based upon sense perception. And you can see, therefore, in sense perception that the source you have to get to the moment of perception, what is called apperception. That's a discriminating uh, function within the world of visible things. Now look here. Third level. That's the ratio. That's what they call the ratio in Latin. The ratio. The ratio is the same word. The word ratio is the same word in Greek. Logos, measure, word, principle, measure, ratio. And it's also called the anima rationalis. It's, it is a gift to man called understanding. Now, the next highest and the fourth horizontal is intellect. The exercise of the intellect. Now we're in the third column, going down, vertical. We have here eternal ideas and primordial ideas. He calls the eternal ideas in the text platonic. Platonic ideas. That's really here, not here. These are simple eternal ideas, such as we mentioned here. And over here are the Platonic forms. He just had them in the wrong place. 
friend. Here, uh, as I say, he doesn't have a category. He doesn't explain this category on page 250. He just states it as the exaltio anima. Uh, the emphasis is on the exaltation of the soul. He has a footnote at 50. Right? The anima is separated from its body. Right? Uh, it is the body's essential quality or soul whose material nature has to be transformed into something higher. Well, uh, this has to be transformed into something higher. That's this. But he doesn't tell us what it is. It's nice to know that it can be transformed into something higher, but he doesn't tell us what it is that has to be transformed into something higher. That's a missing piece in his system. But in, in uh, looking at it in the Platonic world, that's understanding. It has to be transformed into the highest vision which is the clear light, the highest lucidity possible for the intellect. Now, does it appear to you that there is something curious going on here? The Platonic tritologies that he represents in your text, he doesn't go to Plato to explain. He goes to alchemy. And then he goes into hermetic philosophy. He doesn't go to Plato. He never does. Carl Jung always avoids going into Plato. You can go and get the volume in the library on the index to Carl Jung. It's a nice thick volume. And you can look up the name Plato. And you can check all the references. And there's quite a few. But none of the references explore the thought of Plato. He mentions them in a variety of ways, but not any specific content. He does not, I dare say, he won't deal with Plato. Not unlike other thinkers in Europe. They want to keep away from the spiritual side of Plato. They'll play the game in alchemy. They'll play the game in psychology. But they won't do it in philosophy. So therefore, I thought I would like to show you that we can easily relate all of the things he says psychologically and relate it clearly to the whole Platonic tradition as central notions. Now, in the papers I gave you, you'll find evidence of this, but I'm just going to walk through these lists, this list I have here, and then I'm going into the text, and I'll just quote page after page as support for it later. The first point he wants to make, and it's a good one, it's that you cannot tell, you cannot determine, reason cannot determine, when such an enlightenment experience occurs. He calls it a gift of God. He calls it something that's ready and ripe. In the Greek, it's called the sudden. Suddenly, the experience occurs. Nothing that seems to be its primary cause is operating. Therefore, for Carl Jung, he says that's the will of God. That's a gift, gift of God. In Plato, Especially, you can see it in several places. One of the great places in the symposium where he talks about the overwhelming vision of beauty itself. And he says, suddenly, suddenly you behold a wondrous vision. Suddenly. It's always suddenly. In the third hypothesis, it's suddenly. It's the major concept in Plato. That is, since you can't anticipate it, there's nothing you can, you can do in order to reach it. You have to just let go of everything and wait for the fruit. When it's ripe enough, it drops of its own accord, which is, of course, a Zen and Chinese Chan notion. Now, what is this enlightenment, according to Carl Jung? It's the lumina natural. That, that's this, the divine luminosity, right out of Plato, the most brilliant light of being. How do you do it? 
He says, well, there are many, as very, he goes through several ways of describing it. But he says, the primary thing is, if you want to have a vision of the good or the one itself, you have to become one yourself. Now, in Plato's Republic, there's the whole trip, whole exploration of the nature of justice. And it goes on and on, seeking out if you can describe it and what brings it about, whether you can have a vision of this, this, this another idea like beauty itself, justice itself. And so therefore, he finally comes to a point where he then f describes what it is. And I'd just like to read you just one line for um, Now, it's a long paragraph, so I don't know whether I should read the whole thing, but I'll cut it back. Um, but in truth, just as it appears, was something like this. Not, however, in a man's outward practice, but inwardly. And truly, he must do his own business in himself. He must have pulled all three parts in tune with him, highest, lowest, middle, exactly like the three chief notes of a scale and any other intervals between these that there may be. He must have bound all these together and made himself completely one out of many. Temperate, concordant, and then only do whatever he does, getting wealth, care of the body, or even matters of state and private contract. What must you do? He must have bound these together and made himself completely one out of many. That's the key concept in preparing for an experience of justice itself. That's becoming one itself. That's also, as we'll see later, one of the key points in alchemy. It comes right out of Plato. Now, he is now going to say, how do you do it? How do you get this enlightenment? Well, he says, rather curiously, he says, you know what you have to do? You have to study the words of the philosophers. And therefore, in these alchemical works, they're quoting philosophers. And in the quotes, they're telling you how to do this curious thing called philosophy. Then he ends with one of the really great names in philosophy, Parmenides. Now, why is that important? Because, see, Socrates considers everybody around him, and he compares them and talks about all the philosophers, but he says there's only one that truly is the greatest. It stands in great reverence before him. That's the man called Parmenides. He is really the father of the non-dual in Western philosophy. And Plato did a dialogue called the Parmenides, where he attributes to him a whole splendid system of thought. Now, this, this, there's a question about whether this is the same Parmenides, but it has some of the same themes in it from the alchemists. Now, how do you do it? According to do it, you need three things, imagination, meditation, and theory, according to Carl Jung. Now, imagination is the key to it all. Meditation is the source. What does he mean by meditation? in this great work called alchemy. He says, meditation is when you enter into a dialogue with yourself. That's the key. You enter into a dialogue with yourself repeatedly. He said, what that does is wake you up. You're talking to yourself. Finally, you're then becoming attentive to some interesting voice that's very profound within yourself. He said, that's meditation. Becoming devoted to that, going towards it, becoming more and more involved in this inner dialogue, that's the method. He said, but to do it, he says, you have to be in an interesting state. He says, you have to be able to be physically strong and intellectually alert, or psychologically prepared for it. He said, because this process takes sooner or later a concentration of the life force. And he uses this Latin expression, the anima corporalis, right? Corporalis, 
corporeal, the, the soul, that, the physical soul. Now, what is that in Carl Jung? He says, you know what it is? He says, there is, a, 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 in man, there's the diaphragm. He said, below the diaphragm is a center of power. You have to waken that up. And you have to, therefore, utilize the physical and the psychic forces in man to sustain this concentrated life force in your meditation. Because there are going to be times when you're up and down and sluggish, doesn't matter, sit anyhow. Do your inner dialogue. In uh, Japanese uh, Zen Buddhism, that's called the hara. Sometimes called the ki. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, in Tantra, that's this one of the great chakras. Carl Jung calls it the animal compounds. That's the part where you have to arouse that inner force within you to sustain your meditation. Now look here, he says, you can't do anything without imagination. You see, because you're imagining, you're talking to yourself, you've got to maintain that over a long period of time. He says, you know what you do? You have to become attentive to dreams. That's what you need to do, Carl Jung says. Now, how do you treat dreams? He said, well, you have to treat dreams in three ways. You have to expand it, amplify it. You have to allow the dreamer enough room so that they can add to it, so that they can then add their associations to it. And you have to allow them to enter into analogies with, with whatever it is they're suggesting that comes through their dreams. He calls this theory, theoria. Why? Because you want to awaken that higher part of the mind called the noose, where we get the word noetic. Now, that's especially significant because that's the particular power of the mind. That's the intuitive vehicle through which you can gain the enlightenment into the divine. That's the part of the soul. That's now, look here. In order for man to do that, that means in some way there's a part of us, right? there's a part of us which is in some way akin to the divine. Ah, Carl Jung says, According to the alchemists, the soul of man is not entirely contained in the body. The higher part of it is in the divine. That allows, therefore, news to operate. Now, this is a splendid notion. It's a Platonic notion. Plotinus expresses it at some length. Now, in all of Plato, all of the dialogues and all of the reflections in Plato, there's only one place in Plato where he explicitly says there's a way in which you can gain knowledge of the self. Only one way. He says, what you have to do is be able to get a knowledge of the self in three realms. You have to be able to tap your past your present and your future. And if you don't awaken that ability, he says you're not really functioning through the self. Now, how do you get that? Well, in book nine in Plato's Republic, he says there's only one place you can get it, that's in dreams. Now, how do the philosophers work, and what do they do according to this work? Well, it is extremely interesting how he talks about them and what they say you must do. And now I'm just going to, as I said before, I'm just going to jump through a bunch of these quotes and read them since we have this as a background. I pray you, I'm on page um, 243 on to 250, as I'm going to just read several of these quotes. These quotes should fit into what we've been exploring, and especially they should illuminate what it means for him to say you have to look and study the words of the philosophers 
and I'm going into that great sermon by Parmenides. That's where we're going. So, I'm now on page 243, what he calls the mental attitude towards the work. Now he's quoting. He says, here's a text from an anonymous author. I pray you, look with the eyes of the mind at the little tree of the grain of wheat regarding all its circumstances so that you may bring the tree of the philosophers to grow. Dorn says in his Philosophici Medictiva, out of the other things thou wilt never make the one until thou hast first become one thyself, just as we said with justice. In the Rosarium Philosophorum, here's a quote, who therefore knows the salt and its solution knows the hidden secret of the wise men of old. Therefore, turn your mind upon the salt, for it alone, the mind, is the source, is the science concealed in the most excellent and the most hidden secret of all the ancient philosophers. Mind and salt are close cousins, says Carl Jung. Therefore, direct your feelings, senses, and reason, and thoughts upon this salt alone, on the mind alone. This mind, do it again, please. This yeah, mind alone. The mind. Alone the mind. Or yeah. This yeah. Mind yeah. Yeah. The mind. The yeah. Mind. Yeah. That's Just right. The, yeah. Yes, the higher. Right. Um, then he talks about why you have to, why you're going to go through great anguish as you go searching for enlightenment, because the stone will be found. The search is lies heavy on the searcher. It's difficult. Now he says, but. The author is, is in fact of the opinion that the, essentials, the essential secret of this art towards enlightenment lies hidden in the human mind, or put it in the modern terms, in the unconscious, says Carl Jung. Now again, I'm going to quote from another alchemical work, not Carl Jung. Therefore, all those who desire to attain the blessings of this art should apply themselves to study, should gather the truth from the books and not from invented fables and untruthful works. There is no way by which this art can truly be found except by completing their studies and understanding the words of the philosophers. Now, Young adds, Bernard of Trevisio tells us how he struggled in vain for many years till at last he was led into the right path through a sermon by Parmenides and the Turba. And now he quotes it. He should collect the books of different authors because otherwise it's impossible to understand them. And he should not throw aside a book which he has read once, twice, even three times, although he has not understood it, but should read it again 10, 20, 50 times or even more. At last he will see wherein the authors are mainly agreed. There the truth lies hidden. Quoting Lully, Carl Jung, says that owing to their ignorance, men are not able to accomplish the work until they've studied universal philosophy, which will show them things that are unknown and hidden from others. Quote, therefore, our stone belongs not to the vulgar, but to the very heart of our philosophy. Dionysius Zacharias relates, quote, right? to devote himself rather to the study of the books of the old philosophers who has to acquaint himself with the very vera materiae. A 
applying himself to the serious study of the literature. He read diligently, meditated day and night until his finances were exhausted. Then he worked in the lab one day, saw three colors appear. And on Easter day on the following year, the wondrous thing happened. I saw a perfect fulfillment. This happened in 1550. This is his quote now after this enlightenment experience. Turn back, brethren, to the way of truth of which you are ignorant. I, cons I counsel you for your own sake to study and to labor with steadfast meditation on the words of the philosophers, whence the truth can be summoned forth. The importance of the necessity of understanding and intelligence is, ins is insisted upon through all the literature. Then he's quoting again. In truth, the form, which is the intellect of man, is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the whole process. And this form is made clear by the saffron color, which indicates that man is the greater and the principal form in the whole work, the opus. His thought, however, is often anticipated in the Haranai treatise on Platonic tratologies, in which the author represents that work. Now, what's, what's the way? What is he saying? Do you need alchemy for this? He's saying no. You study the ancient writings of the philosophers, you stay with them, read them again and again, diligently, devote yourself to it all the time, do nothing else, get involved in the most, and the most powerful, the most, uh, enlightening literature, go back to the Platonic tradition, get into it, follow it. He's describing the psychological process. Now, here's the strange thing. Plato is not taught this way. Here we have Jung studying alchemy, trying to represent it psychologically, and he gives us a way in which the alchemists were reading Plato or at least the ancient philosophers. But he takes this ancient way of studying to be the alchemical art. I find it rather curious. Isn't it? Isn't it? I it say is. it's astonishing. I, I, I mean, it is. I mean, that is, the alchemy is, if you do that process, the alchemy is going to happen within you. If you sit and have dialogue Certainly. within yourself, it happens. Of course. Yeah, oh, okay, good. Of course, but... <laughs> I thought I missed something. No, 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 no. No, you're absolutely with it. Is it, what I'm saying is that in describing this, he's describing the way alchemists were studying philosophy. When you do it, they'll use this language of alchemy to escape the Inquisition. That's why they were doing it. There were no works published after the 18th century when the Inquisition lost its power. Now look here. Is this an invitation to study philosophy of the ancients? Devote yourself in such a way that psychologically you go through this process, which he can understand? Philosophy is not taught this way in the colleges and the universities. It's taught as an intellectual dead system. Isn't that curious? When did that start happening, that it started being taught? Pardon me? When did that start happening, that it started being taught dead? It was never, uh, no. Um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, our culture has done is that, see, there's a very interesting period in history, and uh, maybe I'll give you a quick look at it. For many, many years, since Lactanius and Augustine, especially Lactanius, who started it in the second century AD, one of the fathers of the church, <clears throat> he had what he called the parallel, the parallels of revelation, divine revelation and partial revelation. He said divine revelation is through the Old Testament, New Testament, or the Bible.
He said, there is something curious happened, he said, actually. At the very beginning of the time of Moses, the great, the really old and great Greek philosophers studied with Moses. And therefore, from the Bible, from the very earliest time of Moses through the prophets, you can put next to them all of the great Greek philosophers. Therefore, there are two lines of revelation. Partial revelation based upon reason and the complete revelation revealed by divine illumination and faith. They're parallel. They're parallel. This was accepted. And they had a very good reason for accepting it. At this point in history, there was a, I'll just tell you the story quickly. St. Paul went on a journey, and with him was Dionysius, his friend, who he converted. Dionysius was present, according to a letter of Dionysius, at the crucifixion. He was the only person that we know of that was present in the crucifixion. He therefore journeyed with Paul on his many version, on his uh, missions, and therefore helped in the spread of Christianity, evangelizing Christianity. He is the man who laid the foundation for Christian metaphysics, Catholic metaphysics. One man laid out the whole course of meta metaphysics. A splendid metaphysics, I want to assure you. Now, I want to represent that here. Now, the thinkers that came after Dionysius, Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, others, including Proclus, the Christian theologians could look at the writings of Dionysius and say, look what they're doing over here. All they're doing is plagiarizing us because we have the whole thing in minuscule right here by the writings of Dionysius. Therefore, there wasn't any hostility between the two of them. Christians were quite content knowing that their writings were divinely revealed and anticipated the whole rational development of philosophy and metaphysics. Therefore, it was quite apparent, now this, now you have to think now for a moment, now the writings are coming in from Byzantium, the first time the Greek tracts are coming in the first time into Byzantium, into Florence, they're being translated. Now, all of this literature, which had been closed for Europe, is now translated into Latin in a giant effort of intellectual scholarship, all that now comes pouring out. Now they can get these writings themselves and they can see that's the case. They don't have to believe it. They can see it themselves. Oh, by the way, a chap by the name of uh, Lorenzo Valla came along. And if anybody should write a play about Lorenzo Valla, this would be a hit. This would be, this is one of the greatest intellectual figures in the European history, and no one studies him. He did many, many things that are truly remarkable. One of the things he did, he learned classic Greek. Everybody who was wanted to get into these intellectual ideas jumped in and learned classic Greek. So he went to the uh, church and he said, excuse me, I'd like to take a look at this document, this great metaphysics of uh, Dionysius. And he looked at it and he wrote a little letter. The letter said, uh, I would like to inform you that this work could not have been the work of Dionysius at the time of Jesus Christ. He could not have been at the crucifixion. The whole thing is a forgery, and it's quite evident, as he showed by a perfect line of reasoning, that it must have been written after Proclus, and the whole thing's a forgery. This is the thing of pseudo Dionysius? And that's why he's called pseudo Dionysius now. He was so powerful a thinker that St. Thomas Aquinas quotes him 1,700 times in his writings. Albert Magnus, the great theologian, 1,100 times. 
He is the most powerful thinker. He framed Christian metaphysics. Uh oh. Another thinker came along, um, Casabandu, Frenchman, and he said, Gentlemen, I'd like to review this idea of the parallel thesis. And he showed by very careful reasoning and looking at the quotes and the text, he said, they're not parallel. You got the dates all wrong. Lactanius and Augustine were wrong. What did that do? It means they were in parallel. It means that many of these things the Greeks preceded the Christians, that they accepted forgeries, and their whole tradition is based upon forgeries. Now, that caused quite a shock in Europe. We don't feel it in this country, but that caused quite a shock in Europe. He did, an, he did two other things that were even more remarkable. He got a copy of the Christian Bible, the Vulgate, St. Jerome's translation, and he compared it one with one of the Greek Bibles that came from Byzantium, and he was so shocked he sent a letter to Erasmus, Erasmus, the great uh, Renaissance humanist, and he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, he said, but uh, we're facing a crisis. The difference between the Greek and the Latin Vulgate, St. Jerome's translation, is so great a difference that there is a scandal. Oh yeah, they had St. Jerome who translated from the Greek into the Latin, used a corrupt text. He didn't know it was corrupt. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? I always go for the chicken, but what, in which, which respect? I mean, what, what, was this um, person who wrote supposedly this course in metaphysics, did he have a divine revelation and wrote it down, or did he copy from that side. Lorenzo Valla said, I can date it at about 530. That's that. And that turned out to be, now scholars accept that. That it is a forgery, it was written at 530. The Catholic Church designed it, someone in the Catholic Church designed it, or accepted it and brought it in. In any case, they were fooled and they, promoted, they considered that to be a, a divine source, but it wasn't. It was actually produced in Syria in, in 530, 532. So did anybody on the Bible side of this question actually have a divine revelation no. to? No. 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 no, no. But it's nothing that a nice little inquisition couldn't tidy up. Yeah. <laughs> so you see, European history went through a series of shocks as this literature came from Byzantium, from the Greek side of the European uh, tradition. Shock after shock. This is a series of shocks. And there were a couple of more which are perhaps more, more significant than this, which caused the Reformation. Reformation became because of this. Now, one of the biggest things is that when, um, when Emperor Constantine left Rome, he moved the center of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople in around 330 A.D. And therefore, there's no longer any Roman Empire or the center of the Roman Empire in Italy after 330. When he left, he left a document saying he gave the right of the Catholic Church in Rome, the right to collect taxes, raise an army, and to be the sole arbitrator of religious matters throughout all of the lands to the west of that line, Italy and therefore had the right to promulgate the faith in all of those areas. That's the basis of colonization and bringing the faith over the United States into, pardon me, into southern uh, South America and promulgating it through Spain and Portugal and all of these countries. It all comes out of this one document that Saint August, pardon me, that Augustine, Emperor Augustine, left when he left Rome and went to, Rome, went to uh, Constantinople. He left the Catholic Church in charge, as it were. Yeah, pardon me. Or Constantine. Constantine. I better watch my language. Watch. Emperor Constantine did that at 330. Right. Uh, and if this I said. Vala is still going on today. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. By the way, Vala looked at this document and he said, Excuse me, I have to tell you something again. That's a forgery. He never left it. 
It was made up in the 850s. It's phony. Therefore, Luther came along and said, let's see from what Vallis said. The Catholic Church doesn't have any scriptural right to be the head of the Christian Church. You need a new Bible. You don't need metaphysics. It's a forgery. Therefore, he said, I think I'll translate the Bible into German. And that started the Reformation in 1525, right? Natural consequence of one man's work, Lorenzo Valla. Valla is Spanish? Valla? Lorenzo Valla. Italian, I believe. Italian. Uh, no, whether he's Spanish or... I, I, I've up to this point thought he was Italian, so you're asking me a question I, don't, I thought he was. Yeah. yeah, giant of a figure. Now, uh, see, when Casabandu did this, which broke the back of the parallel thesis, now it meant that this is heretical. All of this Plato, everything I'm doing tonight is all heretical. You can't reconcile it. It's not partial revelation. You don't need the divine revelation. You don't need faith if you can use reason. Uh-oh, crisis. One of the greatest inventions of Europe in the 13th century was really tremendous. The 13th century invented the university. Arabic works were coming in from Spain. Mathematics, medicine, Aristotle was coming in now from, from Spain. Not from the Byzantium period, but Islamic Spain pouring in. The church was upset by the new heresies coming into Europe. They instituted one of the great systems called the university. Every university, you can check every one of the charters of the university, you can always see it, it's always up front. The term professor, the early days in the 13th century, they had readers because most students couldn't read during those periods, they couldn't read. Therefore, a reader would read them the texts. Now, a professor professes, that's where he gets his name, he professes the faith. And it's his specific job given to him by the church, and most universities was an appendage to the cathedral, the rectors, and it was his duty to stand between the students and the book. And any time the book would challenge their faith, it was his job to profess the faith and slant the text to save the student from being in contact with the direct experience of the text. That's the university. It still functions that way. It's These seats are lined up in pews. Here is what? That's right. Now, a PhD is a doctor in philosophy. You know what his, what his job is? He's a professor to be able to stand in place of a, ch of a churchman in order to safeguard the religious faith and belief of the students. An MA, a Master of Arts, is someone who can stand in the place of a PhD and parade papers and do those things. A BA means you have the right, after you get a BA, to read some of the books by yourself. So to answer your question, you know what we did in Europe with Plato? We put it in the universities. That's, all, that's the only place we teach it. And now we teach it in such a way that no one gives a two dams about it because it's watered down, made intellectual, it's lost its spiritual roots, it has nothing to do with enlightenment, it has nothing to do with the, the vital spiritual nature of man. And therefore, we've emasculated them and hung them up to dry. That's and what universities do. And you're saying that even someone like Jung, as broad-minded as he was, is still doing it. He's avoiding, He's avoiding Platonic yeah, thought but, as spiritual. And yeah, but at least he's bringing in the psychological side of, of philosophy. Isn't that curious? But no one in philosophy today takes this psychological description of philosophy and talks about Plato in view of this. We have emasculated our own spiritual tradition. 
And it's far more profound, by the way, than anything in the East. Yeah. What happened to that course in metaphysics on the right hand side of the board? Nobody reads them anymore. I mean, I mean, you can't get it, really it is so difficult to get. I mean, was it good? Was it bad? Was it right? Was it oh, bad? it's magnificent. It is some of the best and most interesting writing you can find. I went one Easter to um, a Catholic retreat house. I'm not Catholic, I, I just visit a lot of places. Yeah. And because I was going to have an experience, and I, I knew that. And yeah. one of the things yeah. is I had gone down in their library. And actually, my hand found the right book, took it open to the right page, mm -hmm. read the right whatever I needed to read, go in and speak to the, um, uh, I don't even know what you call it, the mm -hmm. Catholic head of this particular place. And he was real friendly until I mentioned what I mentioned, and not to go into everything that I read, but it was basically that um, you can go within and you can become enlightened. And this is what this that I read read, and I said, I said, now let's talk about this. And, and I said, now what do you call this, and what do you call that? And he gave me all the Catholic names for it, which is basically saying, go mm -hmm. within. Mm -hmm. You too are mm -hmm. a son of God. You don't have to go through this mm -hmm. son. And and he all of a sudden like his eyes got really dark, you know. And I felt all this like really wicked energy coming from him. I said to him, I said, and it got worse and worse. And finally, when I said this to him, I said. Well, if this is all true, and you know it, and I know it, how come your parishioners don't? And it was like fire out Goodbye. of there, as you know, it was like, boom, out of there. And I had two days to go on this particular retreat, you know? Mm -hmm. But it, it is, they have it all. It's down there in their basements, in their books. This is what Dionysius did, now called pseudo-Dionysius. Pseudo mean phony, not true. I'll show you what he did. Fine. Now, remember the date, 530. That's when it was presumed to be, to have been written. It entered into history the first time at 530. At 529, from 300, from three, approximately 320, there were a series of laws put in, into practice through Rome in the center of uh, the Roman Empire, Rome. They passed a series of edicts outlawing the study and, and the teaching of philosophy. They even brought a, brought a law in th uh, 370, death to philosophers. But philosophy was still allowed to survive in certain areas. Athens, Alexandria, Syria. In Plato's academy, which started obviously at the day of Plato, Right. Continued uninterrupted, splendid history. But Emperor Justinian, Christian, said, we will close once and for all, all of these pagan Platonic schools of philosophy, we will close them all down. And that ended philosophy in Europe until the Renaissance, when the text came back into Europe in the 15th century. Where did these philosophers go? They went to Syria. They were in exile. They went to Syria. At that place, that's where they found these texts from Dionysius. Isn't that handy? This is what Dionysius did. He saw the end of this great classic culture. He saw it coming. It was final. It was over. They closed everything. Persecuted philosophers. He looked back at this entire Hellenic age, all that they did, and he wanted them to preserve it. So he put into it the major ideas, and he put them in a magnificently and beautiful form and passed it off as if it was Christian. So therefore, what we can do if you have an interest, you can go backwards. Because we're familiar with Christian literature, it's in our culture. You can now read Dionysius, to get the bridge to go back into the Hellenic age. That's the way it should be done. Now, he did several works, and he did 10 letters. And there's a really a very fine text by Hathaway that has translated the 10 letters, and he's got a beautiful introduction and footnotes and everything else. is a very, very fine piece of work. Hathaway is his name, a very fine gentleman. And I. 
always urge people, to, if they have a bookstore, to get that copy of Hathaway's, Donald Hathaway's work on Pseudo-Dionysius, Ten Letters. And if you need the title, uh, in more, more accurate title, I can get it for you. Just drop me a note, and I'll be pleased to send it to you. So that's the, now, that's the work, you see. That's Dionysius. Powerful work. Beautifully written. And he shows people how to get into metaphysics with symbols. It's a text of how to get into, into, but that's the way of the symbolic way of understanding things in the ancient world. So he preserved a great deal of this great metaphysical work of the Greeks under the disguise that it was Christian. They accepted it and therefore it entered into Europe. And it had a massive effect on Thomas. Pardon me? It, didn't it have an incredible effect on Thomas Aquinas? Oh, his Summa Theologica has uh, quoted him 1,700 times. Which just affected all of the Christian world yet again. Yeah. 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 But to, in today's world, it would be fun to get the whole thing. One volume, everything of his, take a look at it, and you'll see that what he's doing is preserving the great Hellenic work in a very fine, condensed form. And he passed it off. So, of course, once that they, just, by the way, the Catholic Church hung on to this until 1895. Well, but then they had to give it up. They had to say, yeah, it is phony. So they accepted the fact that it was phony. There's some people in the church that still want to preserve it because of its richness. So to answer your question, to go back, if it's heretical, you can study it in the university, put a professor between it and the students, and you won't have any trouble. That's what we did. That's what we do. So that is my... And that's why I say Platonism and alchemy is really part of the recovery of Platonism. It's a very strange search. It's a lost treasure. And I encourage people to get back into it because of its depth and its magnificent form and character and beauty. Thank you. Now why didn't why didn't Jung why, why didn't Jung deal with that? I mean, why didn't Jung there it is, it's all over, it's all Plato. He never went into the source, which is Plato's Republic. Obviously one of the most learned gentlemen in Europe of our age. Studied the classic Greek, knows all the languages. Thou shalt not thou shalt not touch Plato. Don't know. Maybe. Don't know. Don't know. I really, I, I really don't know. It's not that I'm, I, I have some pressure. I mean, he probably did know. It's hard for me to believe that he didn't. Precisely. But there is such a prejudice against it, it could possibly be. But, but I mean, but not just be, because, well, yeah, because of the prejudice that, that he would want what he was hinting at to be known, and if he would have put this in it, it would have been banned from all schools. The difficulty I have with that, you see, you and I would expect if that's his goal, then present day Jungians and the Jungian institutes, the institutes, wherever they are, would, teach it. would then open this up and teach the Platonic vision of the Platonic tautologies, etc. And they don't. Matter of fact, the key alchemical works that he mentions in this work they haven't translated. They're still in Latin. Okay, what about something that you read tonight? It's, I don't know the exact quote or, or, or what it was about, but it was something to the effect that only those of beauty could even reach this to 
duplicated within themselves of like kind, of like mind, would only be able oh, yeah. to get this when they were ready. Yeah, yeah. You need an intellect. Yeah. You need a mind. You have to have an interest in this. You have to be the willing vulgar, to. The word the vulgar, the vulgar yeah. will not be able to oh. get this. It's only when you reach a certain level that you'll yeah. be able to even get it. Sure. It's, sure. it's self protecting, really. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Therefore, they don't have to hide it. But they yes, do. Yes, because nobody could get it unless they were ready. So I guess we're willing to say then that the people who go to our universities are, for the most part, ignorant and they ain't going to get it, therefore, let's not give it to them. <laughs> that may be true, but I don't think it will be on, in any catalog that I know of. <laughs> Thank you much.